The following program is a Town of Colony television production of the William K. Sanford Town Library. Welcome to our first segment of Taking Care of Business. Uh, my name is Bill Brigham, and I'm going to be your host today. Before I announce or uh, talk to our, our guest here, um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what uh, I do and, and what my uh, uh, work is with small businesses. I run a not-for-profit with the School of Business at the University at Albany. Um, we're a public agency that helps small businesses grow and be successful. We offer no-cost counseling to small businesses, and, and that can include business planning, market planning, financial projections, access to capital, really a, a lot of the different things that small businesses need. We see about 1,300 small businesses a year, and, um, and uh, I have the, the privilege of probably working with thousands of businesses over the last 20 years. Um, being with the School of Business, um, we do have many interns working on our projects. We work with many of the uh, technology companies that are coming out of the university and also the uh, SUNY Poly. So we really have a, a wide diversity of businesses uh, that we do work with from salon to, to technology development company. Uh, we, we work with um, people with that to get access to capital. We have our own microloan fund that goes up to $35,000 for um, unbankable entrepreneurs, which is a, a new methodology at, of looking at lending. So really, um, uh, the diversity of business, as I said, is, is incredible. Um, but I, I have had the privilege of, of working with Nine Pin Cidery um, since its very beginning. Um, I'd like to introduce Sonia Del Perel. Hello, Bill. Um, uh, you and your son, Alexandra. At, uh, Alejandro. Alejandro, thank you. Um, started Nine Pin uh, probably, I think it was 2013. Yes, we started planning in the fall of 2012. Okay, okay. I, uh, I think it's a kind of funny story for me. Um, all of a sudden, I had a message left at my office, and, and some woman introducing herself saying, uh, my, my son wants to get into the uh, hard cider industry. Um, I don't know why we're doing it, but he really has a passion. <laughs> um, why am I getting into this? And, um, and I, I, I called you back, and, um, and uh, that, that was kind of the, the start of, of the discussions that we've had. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's an amazing story as to where you've gone from, from those initial days. Uh, it, how did he even learn about um, cideries? I don't think they were in New York State to begin with. Well, um, there have been cideries in New York State really for probably about 30 years. I mean, let, we, let's put aside the history of cider in the United States because cider was very big in the revolutionary period and really up through uh, the mid 19th century when beer was introduced. And, uh, but in any event, in the last 30 years, there have been a number of cideries in New York State. Uh, New York State is the uh, the, the state in the United States that has the most varieties of apples. So cideries in New York really work together. Um, most of those cideries were actually known as farm wineries at the time because there was no provision in New York State law specifically for cideries. So um, there were a few pioneers in the 80s and 90s uh, that got cider back uh, into the conversation. Now, now do, you, do you see um, hard cider or, or nine pin, um, your introduction into the market is, is kind of novel? Um, I, I, I have to tell you why I asked that question. Um, and it, it really gets me to the point as to uh, who in the world is your demographic. Um, I was in a, uh, a, a restaurant bar a, a few months ago um, because we could only get the football game there. 
and people kept coming in um, to the bar and asking for nine pin. And I kept looking at them, and, and it was always, it was a different age. It was men, it was women, and I, for the life of me, couldn't figure out who the demographic is that you're working with. Well, we have, um, we didn't really know uh, initially who the demographic would be, but uh, we have done some market research, and um, we find that we're very popular among uh, women the age group is about 25 to 45. Uh, I mean, we have other customers as well, but this seems to be 65% of them or fall within that group. Well-educated, um, and uh, so those are the basic characteristics sure, sure. of our demographic. And how did Alejandro uh, find out about cidery? It's, um... uh, it, he was um, studying hydrology uh, in a graduate program. Uh, he had received a, uh, an SF grant to do snowpack studies um, in the uh, in northern Vermont, and he was so he was at the University of Vermont, and he, um, in his spare time, came across a uh, a cidery, and he he was fascinated. You know, he had grown up in uh, near the capital region in Columbia. County, New York, uh, New York, and uh, uh, amidst you know orchards, we even have a small little orchard at our place down in Ghent, New York, and um, he was fascinated with the the notion that people were using apples to make this delicious drink and volunteered to help out so that he could learn about it. Well, wow. and and so so his enthusiasm, passion, mom, I want to start a, a, a cidery. Um, I guess you have to say, okay. So so what are we going to do? And so so what were what were the steps you would take? Um, because I wouldn't know what to do to begin with, and I I think most people. Um, I think it's kind of terrifying for people to to take an idea and and begin to execute on it and and develop it. Um, how did you get going? Um, through that process. Well, it took um, a little convincing for me to sign on. I was at first skeptical, um, but I started doing some research and learning about the growing cider industry in the United States. Um, and as a matter of fact, it was your office that assisted me with much of that research. You know, you guys have access to all kinds of reports that you would otherwise have to pay thousands of dollars to get. So that was a huge service that you were able to provide. And once I started looking at that, um, I, you know, I, I became more interested. Um, I knew that that my son you know, uh, is very into the science aspect of it, but also into the creative arts side of it. And I knew that he has what it takes to, to decide to do something and to execute it. And it, it may sound strange now, but the reason why I knew this was that in between his uh, 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 college experience at McGill uh, and the graduate degree, uh, he did a couple of things. And one of the things that he decided to do was to hike the entire Pacific Crest Trail, which is a, uh, I think it's, I, I don't want to mis misquote the actual miles, but it has some, it's something like 5,680 miles. It goes from the bottom of uh, the border of uh, California and Mexico, all through California, Oregon, Washington, and nine miles into British Columbia, wow. Canada. And it took him five months, but it took a lot of planning and a lot of uh, preparation. He had to, you know, he prepared boxes that were, you know, that we mailed to him, you know, certain stops along the way. Um, and that dedication to something like that, you know, kind of showed me that he really, once he sets his mind to something, he accomplishes it. So I was, I had the faith in him, I guess. Uh, and then I saw that this was a, an industry that looked pretty exciting. Um, and so that's how we just oh, sort of did that, That's just a, a fantastic, uh, you know, growth into that, that business. First of all, um, being able to um, volunteer in a uh, 
uh, a facility uh, that was processing and, and really getting that first-hand experience. Um, because, um, you know, through the show, we are going to talk about lessons learned all the way through. And, you know, that's, that's one of the uh, problems why businesses fail, because the lack of experience. Mm -hmm. and, for, and people will come in and say, well, I, I've never been in the restaurant industry, let's say. And the thing we have to tell them, well, go work in a restaurant and find out what it's all about. Get the get a, a good good ear to the ground. And it really sounds like like he did that and had that that opportunity to to really find what he what he really wants to do. Um, so now we were we're talking about nine pin early on. Um, that was the time where we started getting into a business plan. Um, I'm not into recreational writing, but um, tell me about that that process a little bit, um, how, how that came about and uh, helped evolve what Nine Pin is today. Well, um, I had I had some experience with business plans. Um, I I'm an attorney, so I had clients and I'd seen their business plans. So I kind of had the model for a business plan, um, and I you know, said to Alejandro, we're going to develop a business plan and then, you know, because we've got to get a framework here and we've really got to, um, this has to be structured. And so um, I started writing the business plan um, with the help of the research through your office. Mm -hmm. That was part of it. Um, and um, that business plan, you know, to get, uh, really, we we pay attention to it still to this day. So. Every month, we're we're revising the business plan, um, and uh, you know, I just I can't imagine having started a project like this without having that roadmap. Um, and I think that's what a business plan really is. A roadmap. Oh, ab absolutely, yeah. and you know, and I I think um, and many of the people we talk to, um, the minute we say you you you've got to write a business plan, and we'll help you facilitate the writing of it, it's like. Are you kidding me? Um, why do I really need to do that? Um, and what, what, what it really is, is is understanding all the different facets of the business and how each one of them, them fits in. If you're weak in one area, it's, it, you need to strengthen that area and, and fit everything together. What I, what I really find challenging with a business like yours is starting from square one. How in the world do you project sales? How do you project how much production you need? How do you, you know, that's that's got to be a little scary. It was a little daunting. Um, you know, I think what, I, you know, what Alejandro said was, look, you know, we're going to, you know, he was adamant that we set up in in Albany. He basically said, you know, we've got a population of, it was, I think it was about 800,000 regionally, something like that. And I mean, he basically did the math and said, gee, if one in 40 people <laughs> drink cider, we should be able to sell X amount the first year. And uh, I mean, this, it was that basic, really. Um, uh, so that was sort of our, our idea, was to focus in a population center and then figure that you know even if one percent of the people uh, were interested that we could still make it um, you know uh, and then you know so once we sort of aim for that amount of people and that that amount of cider that's how we decided on what we wanted to produce in our initial business plan well <laughs> and it's, it's come a long way since then. Um, you know, and, and one thing that I thought was really unusual and unique that um, that you did, which I rarely see a startup do, is look for professional advice um, for your marketing. Because, you know, if, if it's done in your home office or your basement, it looks like it was done there. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, speak a little bit about that. I, I think you, you had a little help in, uh, um, as far as the, the logo goes and development of that. Um. Well, the logo, um, which I still love to this day, and I'm so happy about our initial logo, which is th this green square logo, um, was actually something I learned about through the younger generation. It's a, it was a... Um, 
and it's perfect for startups, so uh, it would be great for you to recommend to mm -hmm. your other clients. It's called 99designs.com, and you pay a nominal fee, and you put out a, like, it's like a um, RFP, right? And there are hundreds of professional designers that look at your RFP, and if they're interested, they submit designs. So in the end, we had about, I think it was 23 designers submit about 185 designs. Wow, wow. Um, and for a very nominal fee in the, you know, in the yeah. scope of the, of the uh, graphic design world. So, and then we, that was, this was probably one of the most fun parts of starting the business. <laughs> we sat and we whittled it down and we tweaked it here and there and we finally uh, got our logo. That's how we got our logo. Um, the other um, professional uh, that we use is a, um, a, P, a small PR firm in Albany. They're a growing small business themselves um, because our uh, starting this business coincided with a lot of exciting um, uh, legislative changes in New York State. So we just... And, and my son had his finger on this, which wow. is why when he, fir and he first came, he said, I was like, okay, well, get a job, and we'll talk about it at night. We'll figure this out. And he was like, no, 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 no. You know, we have to dive in now. And he was absolutely right, because in June of 2013, so we started planning in the fall of 2012, and about eight months later, the New York legislature passed the, the very first farm cidery law in New York. And um, this, and it, this gave a cidery that was focused on New York uh, products um, the ability not only to make alcohol and sell it to bars and restaurants and stores, but to also have a tasting room where you can sell it directly to the public and to go to farmers markets and sell directly to the public. A lot of people don't understand that the since prohibition uh, was, uh, was repealed, it was replaced at that time with a very draconian uh, uh, liquor law okay. uh, that separated the producer from the consumer, basically. So the manufacturers could never sell directly to the to a consumer. Couldn't really talk to the consumer. Wow. So it all had to go through distributors and then the retail outlets and then to the consumer. And this these laws, the farm winery, farm cidery, farm brewery, and farm distillery laws in New York, um, eliminate all of that. And so you know your profit margin for the business is much higher when you can sell directly to the to the consumer. Um, but it also gives the opportunity to educate this consumer about the product. And um, since cider is really a category we're trying to create and sure. grow, this was a wonderful opportunity um, for us. So eight months into this thing, the farm cider law was passed. Um, at the time, we had already apply, applied for a regular cider producer license so that we could start making our cider uh, in the fall of 2013, um, and we did. Uh, we got that license, and we were making it. And then uh, Governor Cuomo signed the law, the legislation, I think, in October of 2013, and the effective date of the law was January 15th, 2014. So we were making our cider aging it, you know, oh. waiting it for it to be ready. Um, and uh, in the beginning of January 2014, I put together the application and got everything ready, sent it out uh, in the, you know, the FedEx on January 14th <laughs> so that it was the first one to arrive. Wow. And we ended up with the first um, ever farm cidery license in New York. And so our PR firm, um, was able to really leverage that, and we received a tremendous amount of press at that time. And uh, you know, you can't, you can't, you can't budget for that. Kind of press, no, you let's can't. Let's put it that way. No, you can't. And <laughs> and you know, I think um, um, with that said, uh, you've always had the professional look. I've always thought. 
of a, a company that's been around for a while, and and from taking nine pin from uh, uh, Rip Van Winkle and and the Catskills, it, it really seemed to. Um, be a nice foundation to, to build your business off of them. Um, and then um, when you actually um, located in the warehouse district in Albany, um, I, I, was, I was a little surprised because we had worked with Albany Distilling there and, uh, and Neil Evans um, helped them out quite a bit and uh, I was able to, to be part of that. Um, and then to see Nine Pin, I, I kind of thought we had the, uh, uh, the craft uh, liquor business uh, of Albany County locked up in that that little area. Um, what what made you look at that area, and uh, you know, and how has that that helped? I know you've, you're going through some expansion there now too. Yeah. Um, well, we had um, really a number, uh, a limited number of available spaces to look at because we had such wacky specifications. Okay. Um, you know, we had tanks that were so high, so we needed ceilings, that we needed a loading dock, um, you know, we needed uh, uh, some drainage, we needed, you know, all of these little factors. We needed um, three-phase electric. So, you know, that narrows the, the realm of possibility sure, down quite sure a bit. Um, and when the space that we're now in um, came, came up to look at, uh, it had another factor, and that was um, that it was situated um, right under a thirty a painting. It's a it's a painting on the brick wall of the building next to us. It's a thirty two foot rose, and it's it's like an outdoor mural. Okay. And that mural was painted by my husband about 20 years ago. So, it, so we were it like, was oh, I felt, I, it was like, <laughs> oh, this is perfect. We're right in the shadow of the rose, you know? <laughs> it felt really like the right space. But in addition, you know, that particular block on Broadway, you know, has a lot of traffic. So we thought, okay, well, this is not so isolated either, you know? So that that's how we ended up. Sure, sure. And I, I, I think now it's it's really turning into a, a great focal point for a, a growth area with, with that's lots. Since we and, came, Druthers and came. And the beer garden yeah, and Druthers. Exactly. And um, I, I, I think it's fantastic to to, to kind of broaden Albany into into that direction. Uh, because I, I think it's been a, an area that um, not many have paid attention to to very, very much. And right. um, now I know another factor was that you could, there was space available adjacent so you could knock down a wall or blow out a wall or... Well, or just, <laughs> we, no, we didn't, we, we just moved in. Yeah. And um, <laughs> exactly, so there was, uh, we knew that in the beginning we weren't quite ready to uh, rent the full 17,000 square feet that we're now in. We started with 5,000 square feet. Wow. Um, wow. So, but then, um, you know, we were able to expand. Uh, we needed to, and, you know, so we didn't have to move. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I remember uh, when I was there early on, uh, um, looking at your your your, your tanks, um, the white, relatively small tanks, um, and and now. Um, they're just huge. It's it's incredible <laughs> the the capacity difference um, from from when I initially saw it to, to now. Um, and and now, how many employees do you have? Um, you're really going through some some very fast growth here. Yeah, we we now have. Um I guess 11 employees. I, I'd like to say 12 because Alejandro works there, okay. you know, 24-7, but um, doesn't count, apparently. Uh, for, <laughs> no, for, it doesn't. No, so. <laughs> uh, but uh, so we do have a number of employees there. We have salespeople, and we have uh, the production staff, and then we have the tasting room staff also. So. Oh, that's, that's just fantastic. Yeah. And capacity, I, I think there's a maximum capacity. There is. Under the law, um, the uh, the most we could the most so, and this is a drawback of a farm cidery sure. license, but um, the most we could make a year is two hundred and fifty thousand gallons of cider. Wow. Um, we're far from that, but we now have the equipment to so that. that when we get there, when we are you know in the next few years, hopefully we'll get there. But now is that something that you're looking uh, for change? Um, you know, it, it it seems like. 
um, a, a, another one of those regulations that it, you know holds back an industry from from really growing. Well, the initial the initial law was 150,000 gallons, okay. so we've got we're, you're, we're you're up to 250. <laughs> I don't want to ask for too much. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so, but for now, I think that that's probably a. A very decent, that's a lot of cider. Sure, oh exactly. <laughs> so. And I, I remember uh, Alejandro, um, I think he made mention of um, of the hard cider industry being uh, the ugly stepchild of, uh, of the, the craft beer industry. Um, you know, now craft beer, um, that, that industry everybody's seen go crazy for the last two decades. Um, you go into a beverage market now and it's like where did all this come from? Um, and uh, you know, it's it, it's just mind-boggling um, the number of labels. Now, how is how is this industry following that? Is it? Do you see it as being is growing in the same way? Uh, yes, I do. Um, it's definitely um, the number of farm cideries has exploded in the three years that they've uh, that they've existed. Um, we recently formed the New York State Cider Association, and we have more and more members there. Um, and you know, the idea is to create a, a category, really. Okay. That, yeah. know, whereas, I think craft beer kind of took over uh, part of the overall beer category. Oh, sure. It was, you know, it was, just, it was beer was an established category. Cider is a category that is becoming established. And some of the ciders that are out there are more towards the sort of the fine wine end of ciders. Um, and other ciders are more, you know, geared towards sort of the craft beer culture. So it's not exactly following craft beer, you know, uh, that that model per se, because there is there are other ciders uh, that are you know um, uh, that are made uh, uh, with you know specifically only with the traditional cider apples and yeah. um, so the, so there's a range of different types of cideries within the cider market. And uh, we're unfortunately we're going to have to start wrapping up. Um, I've I've got a lot of things that I still want to talk um, to you about. <laughs> And and also your collaboration, I, I think that's amazing. Um, you just had a event um, at your uh, location. Yes. You, you invite all your competitors in, around New York State to to come and join you. And and I've always thought, what? <laughs> <laughs> your, your competitors? Yeah. Um, are you trying to keep your enemies close? <laughs> it isn't really that case. Well, really, it is about creating the category. Sure. Uh, and. Um, you know, it's very. We think it's very exciting. There are a lot of brew festivals and things where you can, you can go, and it, the focus is just you know people go there and they don't. They're really not interested in learning about the beer. They just want to drink it. You oh, know what absolutely. I mean? Absolutely. Uh, so we think of this as more of an educational experience, where you get to come and talk to the cider makers, and not only can you taste everything, but you can also. You know, under a license, we can sell for you know to go. Oh, and that is great. So you know, people can develop their own home cider cellar uh, by coming and choosing various ciders from. Just, uh, the it's a fantastic ciders. way to to really educate and and let people know. Um, my name's um, Bill Brigham. I am director of the Small Business Development Center at the University at Albany, and you know, we are going to be looking at at lessons learned. I, I think we we learned hear about the a little bit about the importance of planning I, I, I think that's that's really key I also think um, you know using the experiences that you've had and, and also Alejandro as to you know taking that creative part of yourselves um, into a business and and really uh, developing like that and and we we've got to have you back and and, and talk a little bit more because uh, uh, th there's so much more going on and um, and really uh, seeing where you're going and uh, and I will want to know um, in five years um, what you would change if you're looking back but you bet yeah thank you <laughs> thank you so much Bill.